let's jump into Constantine Kissin. Constantine Kissin is a, has a very popular um, what is it called? podcast, YouTube show, trigonometry uh, that he has with his co-host uh, out of London. Uh, they don't seem interested in interviewing me. I've, I've tried. Uh, I'll keep trying, I guess, when I go to London. But um, his is like a has been a kind of a right of center, atheist right of center perspective over the years. Um, it, you know, he did a very famous interview with uh, with uh, Sam Harris that got Sam Harris in deep trouble. But he's interviewed a lot of big names uh, and and is I think in the podcasting world uh, very very uh, very influential. Um, and uh, very big, anyway, big. Anyway, uh, you know, there's been these discussions about, uh, you know, atheism, Christ culturally Christian, Dawkins did, Ian Hersey Ali becoming, uh, uh, you know, converting or, or rejecting atheism uh, for the sake of... Um, of uh, embracing Christianity, and, and you really see, you're seeing more and more discussion about that. Dawkins, again, saying that he is now a, a culturally a Christian, uh, even though he's an atheist. And you're seeing more and more of, um, I'd say, the secular world retracting, entrenching, and it, some of them just straight out embracing Christianity. Others saying, yeah, we get the appeal of Christianity. We, we can't actually become Christian, but we get it. You know, we understand it. And it seems to be almost no voices saying, no, wait a minute. What are you talking about? Christianity is awful. And um, you should reject it. And atheism doesn't give you a philosophy. You should embrace a good philosophy. That voice is not there, so... I, I guess uh, I'm it, or, or there, there maybe a few others that are doing this, but uh, not many. Um, so, um, <laughs> Paul Azuz says, they've had Stephen Hicks on a couple of times. Maybe they think that one objective is enough. There's a difference between, you know, uh, Stephen Hicks and myself. I, I am much more obnoxious. <laughs> To go back to a question out there, I'm much more strident, um, and I, I'm much more controversial. Stephen does it all very lightly and very softly, and very, you know, in a in as much of an unoffensive as as you can. You know, they 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 don't want my attitude. I mean, uh, uh, and um, you know, it, some people don't mind it, like Lex Friedman. Obviously, but but some people don't like my attitude, and uh, that's fine. They've also had Alex Epstein, Ep Epstein, I think, on. So they've had Alex, but you know, my attitude towards religion, my attitude towards uh, these other things are not easy for these people to uh, take in. It's interesting. I just saw a clip of Jordan Peterson, which which ex would explain why I may never be on his podcast, right? It, even though people are trying to convince him to have me on, I might never be on because he said that of all the podcasts he's done, the one he disliked the most was the podcast he did with Destiny. And he, and, and he was asked why, um, why, uh, <laughs> uh, why he was so opposed, why he didn't like the podcast, the, the podcast he did with Destiny. And he said, because Destiny was combative. Destiny had a certain perspective and in a sense was trying to convince Jordan Peterson of that perspective. And Jordan doesn't want that. He wants to have, he, he doesn't want people who think they know the truth. He wants people to have a conversation about stuff. He, 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 he you know, you can disagree, but you have to be, you know, just converse about it rather than have a vigorous, he, he doesn't want debate. He doesn't want a, a kind of a vigorous debate. He views that as childish. Um, I can understand why he wouldn't want me on because I, I take it more as, uh, you know, this is, um, this is how I see the truth. I, I'm, not, I'm not playing games here. This is not about, 
you know, let's find a middle ground or let's find, let's have, let's have a conversation. But my point of view is pretty straightforward. It's pretty clear. It's, it's not equivocal. Um, anyway, uh, that is, that was interesting that I saw, I saw that recently from uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, oh, I forgot to make this announcement. That's right. Maybe because I don't have. Yes. Um, if you want to attend, talk about Peterson, right? If you want to attend my Peterson Academy uh, uh, class, the class I'm giving for Peterson Academy, uh, then uh, you can, right? You can be in a live audience there and you can sit through the whole thing and you can see how they do it and the process and, and experience, you know, me teaching and all of that. I'm doing eight hours on finance, the history of finance, what finance is, the nature of finance, eight hours on finance uh, for the Jordan, uh, for the Peterson Academy. Uh, it's in two weeks and you can sign up. I think you go to petersonacademy.com slash brook, petersonacademy.com slash brook. And you, you have to apply to be there. They don't let riffraff in, I guess. But, uh, you know, last time we had a, a small class, which was fine. Um, uh, but uh, it would be great if we had more people and it'd be great if I got to meet you guys. So, uh, yeah, please consider com coming and, and signing up for it. So petersonacademy.com slash Brooke. And if you come, if you sign up and you come, then you also get like, I think, a year free of Peterson Academy courses. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's a, a good in in. in good reason to do it. I think they're going to have, over time, they're going to have hundreds of courses, hundreds of classes uh, and by by variety of different professors. And um, it's going to be a, a good place to gain knowledge about different topics from experts. So it should be, it should be fun. All right. Let's, uh, let's jump in uh, to uh, Kissin. Oops, let me do this. There we go. There he is. Uh, I'm doing it about two minute fifty in. He's he's kind of given an introduction. He was an atheist. He he was enamored by the new atheists, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and and uh, and uh, the other guy. And now, uh, so I skipped that. Now he's into why, in a sense, he's turned against them. Why he's turned away from them. And uh, this is, I think, where the interesting part starts. So uh, we will begin, and as you know, I'll stop him every three seconds and comment on it. ...in 2006, and Hitchens delivered God is not great the following year. The argument was no longer about encouraging religious people to calm down and leave the rest of us alone. It was increasingly that religion was inherently wrong and bad. But isn't religion inherently wrong? That is, isn't that part of why the whole idea of atheism is, is, is that it's wrong? That is, this, you know, one of the questions you have to ask yourself about all these people that are uh, turning away from atheism is, have they discovered that Christianity or religion generally is right? Have they discovered that that is where truth lies? Not truth uh, in terms of human interaction, but truth, metaphysical, epistemological truth and moral truth. Is that where truth belongs? Is that where truth is? Is the method of religion, the method of discovering truth, is that why they're moving away from atheism or is it something else? So yes, Hitchens and, and Dawkins and others started to say Christianity is wrong. And generally, things that are wrong are probably bad for you. I'll say that again, because it's quite surprising, right? Things that are wrong are probably bad for you. One of the reasons we want to seek the truth. You know, truth shall free you, truth shall liberate you, something like that. There's a saying, right? But wrongness is not unrelated to um, benefit. And if religion is wrong, it's probably not good for you. It was around this point that I began to lose my faith in atheism. The God delivered. Notice that he started to lose his faith in atheism. And indeed, if that's how you hold your atheism, as faith, then <laughs> you could lose at any time. You could gain at any time. It's faith. I don't hold my atheism as faith. I hold my atheism as a reasoned conviction. 
is something that, based on reason, I have concluded. It's the other side that holds their views on faith. And indeed, if all atheists have to say is, I have faith in atheism, if that's all atheists have to say, then atheism is worthless. But if atheists have to say is something about the use of reason and its validity and its justification, and by using reason we can see that the case for God is false, then you're not an atheist by faith. But it is revealing. I mean, his use of words, he's reading this. This is written text. He has thought about every word that he is saying. And he is saying faith in reason. You know, not good, not good. On this point that I began to lose my faith in atheism. The God Delusion was the last Dawkins book I read, and the appeal of that discussion went quickly for several reasons. First, it was clear to me that to attempt to challenge Islamic extremists with facts and logic, as Dawkins, Hitchin, and Harris had done, was to fail on purpose. Now, notice, I don't think, I think, I don't think that's true, but notice um, that this is, he's going to make a really good point, a really, really good political point that pretty much I've only heard objectivists make before this. I mean, he's going to make it as a side issue when, when this is a really, really important point. So I don't, I don't think he quite understands the gravity of it and the importance of it. But uh, this, is, this is true, right? And, and this is the sense in which, uh, and this relates to, to Islam and the threat of Islam. Despite their efforts, most of the Western world today operates under de facto blasphemy laws, which are enforced not by religious activists lobbying for censorship, but by knife-wielding fanatics and suicide bombers. Absolutely. That is, we stay silent. We don't say things about Islam, certainly in Europe, because we're afraid. And we're not afraid arbitrarily. We're not afraid out of faith. We're not afraid because, uh, you know, uh, uh, just emotional, because we're emotionless, like so many people are afraid of, uh, you know, uh, uh, going to New York or something. But this is a rational fear. These people have said what they will do to, to, to those of us criticizing their religion. And in certain parts of Europe, they have acted on it. They have done it. So you know exactly what's coming. So this is a completely rational fear. And this is the point he makes, which is rare that anybody else makes that's very good. The liberalism that the new atheists so enthusiastically espouse, the idea that we should be free to criticize, mock, and satirize anything, including religion, only works when the government is willing to protect you from the consequences. That is right. And that is the job of the government. That's the part that's missing that he hasn't said. It's the job of the government, and it's what it means for the government to protect a First Amendment right. What it means for the government to protect your First Amendment right is to protect you from the knife-wielding Muslim who is going to kill you because you criticize the religion. It means that the government is going to do what it can to destroy the capacity of the knife-wielding Muslim to do that. It is something that Leonard Peikoff wrote about in 1989 with regard to the fatwa against Salman Rushdie by Ayatollah Khomeini. And he said, it's the job of the US government in its responsibility to protect the freedom of speech of Americans to silence Khomeini, to prevent him from living by that fatwa and to do whatever is necessary in order to do that. Whether that means replacing the regime in, in Iran, whether it means rounding up all the fanatics who uh, uh, abide by this version of Islam and therefore are, are eager to kill Salman Rushdie. And, and of course, this was not an idle threat. Uh, Salman Rushdie went into hiding for many years. And of course, recently, what was it, a year ago, he, uh, maybe it's a year and a half ago, was attacked by a knife-wielding Muslim and had his eye taken out and lost use of one of his arms. And why? Because the United States government failed in its responsibility to protect 
his freedom of speech. So, great point. Uh, you know, if we if we argue that we should we we should be allowed to offend Islam and to criticize Islam, we need the government to protect us, to protect our ability and our right to do exactly that. In seeking to liberate us from the tyrannical instincts of dogmatic Christians, the new atheists actually delivered us into the hands of a different and far more pernicious religious zealotry from which the ordinary citizen has no security at all. So I, I don't know if he's talking here about Islam, but we're not delivered into Islam. And certainly the new atheist didn't deliver us into Islam. And certainly it's not a criticism of the, the criticism of Christianity that led us into Islam. And the new atheists were very, very good at criticizing Islam. And they had the balls and the courage to do that. And one wonders, in spite of the government's pathetic nature, and pathetic respect for, for, for uh, freedom of speech, if more of us, more of us, stood up and criticized Islam as a mass, as a large group, the Muslims would have to retreat. The only thing that gives them power is that individuals do it and everybody backs away from them. That's not the new atheist fault. I mean, they were courageous. They stood up and spoke. It's our fault that we didn't have their back, that we didn't support them, that we didn't come out in mass to support their attack on religion, and particularly their attack on Islam. And we didn't. And our governments didn't. And our intellectuals didn't. And our media didn't. And nobody did. So they were less... So we are all left at the whim of... Islamic fanatics who are willing to kill us for what we say and for the criticism, our criticism of their religion. We don't yet have, yet I emphasize, have the Christian fanatics who are gonna come after us for criticizing their religion. Second, the fact that many religious ideas are scientifically inaccurate and that rel Many religious ideas are scientifically inaccurate? That's the best you have? Many scientific ideas, you know, are scientifically inaccurate. Burning bushes, sun stopping, the day stopping so Joshua can finish his battle and win. Resurrection of Christ, scientifically inaccurate. Is that how you would present it? How about scientifically false? Scientifically BS, made up. I mean, it's this... I guess he took atheism on faith, so what are you going to do here? It's no. It, they're false. Scientifically false. And by the way, false. Not just scientifically false. Factually, factually false. And arbitrary. Somebody told the story. We all believe that story. Why? Because somebody told the story. Because of faith. Not because of reason. Many religious ideas are scientifically inaccurate and that religion has been and continues to be used for evil is not in dispute. Indeed, one of the core claims of the new atheists is that religion produced evils that were far worse than the body count of non-believers. Sure, Stalin, Hitler and Mao were bad, they argued, but they weren't motivated by their atheism or its holy book. That's right, they weren't motivated by atheism. They were motivated by a new religion. And this is interesting because later on, later on, I, I hope we get there, he will talk about woke and the new left being a new religion, right? And uh, that we've, we've given up on Christianity, we've adopted this new religion, call it woke. Then why won't he acknowledge here, which there's a sense in which I agree with him, why won't he acknowledge here that communism and fascism had all the trappings of religion, all of them? They had a leader who communes with the world of spirits. They had, uh, you know, they had a, the individual sacrificed to the good of the spirit, proletarian, Aryan race, whatever you want to call it. No, he's not going to say that those are religions. He's going to say they were done in the name of atheism. Atheism made them possible. And I say, no, religion made them possible. Religion made them possible. 
This view of the Holocaust, Stalinism and the Great Leap Forward as accidental byproducts of a non-complicit atheism is, to me, a complete misunderstanding of the impact a lack of religious faith has on the way we think about other human beings. This but, but it is religious faith, isn't it? It is religious faith. It's adopting all the ways in which religion, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way religion works. It's just taking a different God. It just replaces God. And it's not done in the name of atheism. And it's not that atheism necessitates, as he's going to say in a minute, a disrespect for human life. He's missing the point. And then he makes the right point later on. But he won't connect it to here, which tells me he's not thinking straight. To me, a complete misunderstanding of the impact a lack of religious faith has on the way we think about other human beings. The central positive feature of the religious worldview is to ensure that human beings do not see themselves as the sole arbiters of truth and justice. Exactly. And, but that is not the good of religion, right? He says this is the one good thing about religion that individuals don't see themselves as the arbiters of what's true and what's just, then who is the arbiter of what's true and what's just? What's, who's, who's the arbiter of what's true and what's just? I mean, God, I guess. Reality, but reality doesn't, there's no justice in reality. There's no even truth in reality. Who is the arbiter of what true is just? It's the individual. It has to be the individual. Now, individuals might make mistakes. They might get it wrong. But there's nobody else. So even people who take it that it's God, who take it that it's God, are, all they're doing is subjectively, them personally, Choosing what God, what truth, what justice, depending on what religion and how to interpret that religion in this particular context, they have. You don't get out of that fact that only individuals can judge. Only individuals can decide what's true. You, can't, you don't get around that by adopting religion. You just maybe make it more arbitrary, more second-handed, more collectivist by adopting religion. That's all. But it's still true that the individual makes that choice. And if God was like, yeah, you know, you sh really shouldn't murder people. You really, you know, shouldn't engage in, um, in slaughter. You, you shouldn't fight over religion. But that's not God. That's not in Judaism, and it's not in Christianity, and it's not in Islam. God is not that at all. Respect human life. There's no respect for human life in religion. I think I told you this. I, I read this statistic, which is stunning. During the 30-year war, Germans killed a third of the German population in the name of Christianity. The Catholics killed the Protestants. The Protestants killed the Catholics. A third of Germans' population was killed through the in infighting within the German states between those who were Protestant and Catholic killing each other. Impact a lack of religious faith has on the way we think about other human beings. The central positive feature of the religious worldview is to ensure that human beings do not see themselves as the sole arbiters of truth and justice. Not a positive, a negative. That having torn God down from his pedestal, we do not put ourselves in his place. Yes, of course, atheist mass murderers like Stalin and Hitler weren't motivated to kill millions because of religious differences. But their ability to rationalize their actions and to persuade other people to support them was a product of the sense in which, in the absence of God, we get to make up any rules we want. No. No, no, no. It's in the absence of reason we get to choose whatever, we, we make up whatever reasons we want. It's the absence of reason that allows us to rationalize whatever we want to rationalize. It's exactly what religion did. It's exactly what the Catholics and Protestants did in rationalizing, slaughtering each other. All Stalin and Hitler did was take the same kind of rationalizations that Christianity has had 
since it was adopted by the Roman Empire to justify slaughter and use those rationalizations to justify slaughter in the name of a new god, the proletarian or the Aryan race. There's no difference here. Indeed, it's only once you abandon reason, once you embrace faith, once you embrace the complete and utter subjective nature of belief and faith, it's only when you do that can you rationalize this kind of behavior. And the only way to get rid of this kind of behavior, the only way to not rationalize mass slaughter, is to have respect for the human mind, for reason, and to demand reasons for everything that you do. To actually demand that if you're going to act in a particular way, there be a reason to do it. Not a rationalization, not a made up for the sake of others. And that requires that truth and justice be a determinant at the individual level. Only the individual can reason. Only the individual can think. There's no collective thinking. There's no collective reasoning. It's the religious mentality of a communist, of a fascist, of a Christian, of a Muslim, of a Jew. It's that collectivistic religious mentality. That is the mentality that can rationalize away anything. Anything. God wanted it. That, that's it. All I have to say is God wanted it. You have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, is Lenin's term. To benefit the Aryan race, so six million Jews have to die. Why is that a big deal? It's to the benefit of the Aryan race. It's the benefit of God. God commanded this. The Aryan race demands this. What's the difference? It's an authoritarian epistemology. It's the epistemology that says, oh, God. It's an epistemology that says you cannot discover truth and you cannot judge what is just, but have to accept truth and what is just from an authority, from an authority who communes with the spirits, the spirits of the Aryan people, the spirit of God, the spirit of somebody, but you are nothing. You just follow orders. That's where you get the murder and slaughter and Holocaust and destruction that World War II and communism brought us. Atheism is nothing. It's just the negation of faith. It's what do you replace Christianity with? You don't replace it with atheism. You have to replace Christianity with a reason-based idea, a reason-based philosophy, a rational set of ideas. It's what the Enlightenment started to do and what I think Ayn Rand completes. But that's the, the opposite of Christianity, the opposite of religion, is not atheism. The, if religion is a set of ideas about epistemology and about morality, as Ayn Rand called it, a primitive philosophy, then the alternative, the opposite of it, has to be a philosophy. And if this philosophy over here is based on faith and collectivism and, and a platonic, uh, a, a, a philosopher king type epistemology, then the opposite of that is an epistemology of reason. Reason can only be an individual, is an individual characteristic. Only individuals can reason, so therefore a philosophy of individualism and reason. That's what combats religion, not atheism. And that's why communists and socialists are on the religious axis, because they embrace the philosopher king epistemology, and they embrace collectivism, they embrace altruism, they embrace all the key philosophical characteristics of religion, and they apply it to something a little different. So, so it's, it's stunning to me to place religion over here and communism and fascism over here because they disagree about which God to worship. I mean, this is what's required to do real thinking 
is to see what's common and what's different. And what you discover is there's far more common between Christianity, socialism, and fascism than there is different between them. Far more common. And yet the real alternative is an enlightenment-based, reason-based, individualistic-based ideology. I don't know why that's so hard, but it seems to be unbelievably hard, but it seems to be that almost nobody, nobody out there gets it. And, and it truly, that is truly, truly stunning and strange. All right, let's keep going. This is precisely why we had to invent the concept of human rights in the immediate aftermath of World War II. We don't invent human rights in the immediate aftermath of human, uh, World War II. I mean, again, historically, this is completely perverse. They don't invent human rights after World War II. I mean, the concept of individual rights, which are basically human rights, the only legitimate human rights that exist, it was not invented after World War II, it was invented during the Enlightenment. And it's the negation of that concept during World War II that led to the horrors. And was, it was a concept that came about during the Enlightenment because of the horrors that religion brought us in the 30-year war and the 100-year war, and a realization that reason was our means of survival and we needed an individualistic philosophy in order to thrive. And that was the Enlightenment project, a reason-based individualistic project. And from that uh, reason-based individualistic philosophy, and out of that project came the concept of individual rights, not after World War II, in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. Without a worldview in which we are all worthy of dignity and respect by virtue of being children of God, you have to reinvent that particular wheel through. Don't have to reinvent it. That, that wheel was gone by the time you have individual rights. You don't need the UN. You just need a proper philosophy of rights, which John Locke certainly gets us on the right road. And you're trying to subvert that and basically return us to a primitive Christianity, which is just so sad. For the United Nations. My point is, it is extremely easy to prove that religion is evil, but I'm not convinced that proving that it causes more evil than its absence is quite as easy. Third. Well, the absence, what it, is it, what comes in instead of it? Sure, you can think of stuff that come in that's worse than it. The central question new atheists fail to answer, and one that we put to Richard Dawkins in this interview here, is whether irrespective of how scientifically true religion may or may not be, it is nonetheless both useful and inevitable. I, I, I don't think it's useful, and I, it, it might be inevitable. That is, I think, inevitable for 2,000 years ago, maybe even inevitable for 300 years ago, but it's not inevitable today. And I don't know why you can't see the difference. I don't know what Dawkins' answer is, but it's, the fact that it was inevitable for man before the discovery of science and reason doesn't make it inevitable for man in a modern, civilized, rational, science-based society. The Dawkins answer is as close to quoting Karl Marx's idea that religion is the opium of the masses as you can get without reproducing it verbatim. The comfort that you get from believing a falsehood um, is like a drug and, and is a perfectly valid argument to say that, that there's everything to be said for the drug. No, no, no. It is like a drug. I agree with that. But you can't be positive about that. <laughs> Reality will always beat the drugs. I mean, unless you're in unbelievable pain, unless your life is rotten, unless you're about to collapse and die, and you need the drugs just to survive. Shh, okay, but in a normal life, to live on drugs is awful versus the alternative. But that's what religion offers you. It offers you a drug. And Dawkins is saying, eh, not too bad. This is a persuasive argument in the sense that truth matters irrespective of how uncomfortable and practical it may be. That's true. But the problem here is that the absence of old religion seems to produce only a vacuum into which a new religion rushes in. And this new religion... That is, that is true. 
and that was true of socialism and communism and fascism, which you failed to mention earlier, and that, it, that was true and is true. But isn't the question then is why? And uh, is, is there something you can do about it? Is there some better way we can arrange things so that we don't fall into a new religion every time we give up an old religion? And by what standard does one measure the old new religion worse than the old religion if it's all based on faith? So uh, it's the real question has to be, is there a proper alternative to religion? Is there a set of ideas that can produce a, a culture that is devoid of religion? That's the question. And I think the answer is yes, but it requires effort. And that's the kind of answer that they're not seeking. They're not even investigating because it leads them towards reason. And reason is the one thing that never makes it into these conversations. It's, it's truly surprising has just as little regard for the truth as the old ones. That's why Richard Dawkins, who spent his best years arguing with creationists, is now increasingly forced to explain basic biological concepts, like the inability to change your sex by incantation on national television. The reason new atheism has- So it's interesting that he's, again, he's uh, just pointing this out, something that I told you would happen. He's calling woke or modern leftism a religion, but he didn't call socialism and fascism religion, which is interesting. Why not? He should have done exactly the same back then. Has lost its because it, it it wasn't supporting the the claim that he was trying to make. Television. The reason new atheism has lost its mojo is that it has no answers to the lack of meaning and purpose that our post-Christian societies are suffering from. That's right, and and atheism isn't supposed to because atheism is not a philosophy. Atheism is just the rejection of you know, mysticism. It's a rejection of faith. So what's the positive? Where's the positive? And that is, again, the question. Is there a positive that you can imagine? They can't. And this is where they fail so, so badly. And this is where the new atheists failed, because they offered a critique, but they never offered a positive argument which wouldn't have been bad if somebody else had offered a positive argument, but nobody with cultural force leveraged what the new atheists were doing in order to offer that positive argument. What will fill that void? Religious people have their answer. Do the rest of us? Um, that is actually a great way to end it. What will fill the void? Uh, religious people do have an answer to it. They know what will fill the void. Do we know what will fill the void? Do we have an answer to that? And I think we, I, do. And it's my, our job to get the word out there, that there is an alternative to fill the void. And that alternative is enlightenment values and ultimately objectivism, ultimately Ayn Rand. And That's what we're trying to do, and, and it's crucial. And notice that the answer is reason and rationality. That's, at the end of the day, the answer. Because the problem is primarily epistemological. Note how he said faith in, uh, faith in atheism and how he said, um, you know, he was negative about the idea that the individual is the judge of what's true.